Yeah, this is another exciting episode of Art of the Trenches, where I sit here in the chair of wisdom and answer all your questions about the Great War. Nicola on Facebook writes, Hi, first of all, thanks for all the amazing videos. Cool. I love your channel. Uh, I have a question on your special on the stormtroops and their tactics. I was under the impression that the whole Auftragstaktik was a doctrine developed back in the days of von Moltke the Elder, but you said it was instead a rebellion against the Prussian Orthodoxy. So I'm a bit confused now. Can you tell me where that info came from? If I'm not mistaken, I've read the claim that the debate uh, Auftrag's tactique versus more rigid planning goes back to Moltke the Elder in Quest for Decisive Victory by Robert uh, Cetino. I can check the end notes and double check with your sources if you think it will be useful. Thanks again and keep up the great work. Greetings from Italy, Nicola. All right. Well, let's be clear here. The origins, if you want to call them that, of Auftrag's tactique or mission tactics go even further back than Moltke the Elder. Uh, go back to the age of Napoleon and the Battle of Jena and Auerstedt in 1806. Long story short, um, the Prussian army was beaten due to a lack of competent leadership and the strict chain of command proved utterly useless. When some generals were absent or were out of touch, you couldn't get hold of them, the lower officers refused to take the initiative and they just waited for orders that never came and they let the French easily outmaneuver them and win decisively. This defeat led to a massive reorganization of the Prussian bureaucracy and military command structure under von Gneisenau and Scharnhorst. Um, in 1812, they introduced a new system of rules for the Prussian infantry, which revolved around the idea of mitdenkende Gehorsam, or thinking obedience. During the wars of the 19th century, this concept, while supported by military thinkers like von Clausewitz, um, was not entirely uncontroversial and was mostly disputed by conventional tacticians who did not want troops to interfere in the grand scheme, the grand overall scheme of the battle plan, and who would rather specify their objectives. While high-ranking generals from then on uh, enjoyed more freedom of initiative and command, the lower ranks of officers were still grilled in column tactics because of the size of the army's body and the openness of the battlefield. Now this was about to change further when Moltke the Elder was commanding as chief of staff of the Prussian army. Moltke said, diverse are the situations under which an officer has to act on the basis of his own view of the situation. It would be wrong if he had to wait for orders at times when no orders can be given but most productive are his actions when he acts within the framework of his senior commander's intent. The Great War reawakened and reshaped those ideas in the form of two new German principles, the Deep Defense and the Sturm Battalions. Trench warfare was fast and confusing, and officers had to react quickly and with resolve. The freedom of command was given to even lower rank officers to act on their own, either during defense or in attack out of reach of the higher command. It's true that the general idea of mission tactics was way older than the Great War. But this war was the first that specifically focused more and more small groups of men that acted as self-reliant teams. Officers could get killed, communications cut, units lost, but to fight on, you had to rely on even low ranking officers or veterans to act competently on their own. Some old school thinkers in the hierarchy refused to accept the new reality that leading from horseback, if you want to call it that, was out of style. But form gave way to necessity. The German army perfected the art of small unit tactics further in the 20th century with the focus on the Feldwebel that would be adopted, for example, by the U.S. Army in their heavy reliance on the sergeant and the platoon. Ethan Sommer says, Great show, I have a question. When troops went over the top, how did they typically deal with their own barbed wire directly in front of their trenches? Would love to hear your thoughts on this. Keep up the great work. Thank you, Ethan. Uh, the barbed wire in front of their own trenches had gaps in it. Um, usually, they were set up so they were in the line of fire of machine guns to let the enemy funnel in and then mow them down easily from the sides. 
Um, that was usually enough for small rating teams to slip through going out. But most lines of barbed wire were not in place immovable objects, at least if they were still intact and had not been destroyed by shelling. You had specialized troops, often pioneers, that knew how to handle barbed wire emplacements. They would go out, mostly in the cover of night, and then grab and drag them out of the way, out over to the side. This was mostly in preparation of a larger offensive where a huge amount of troops had to go over the top all at once. Um, there were, of course, variants of barbed wire, and there were some that were like nets on the ground. Now this was very hard to get rid of, but these were usually used to make some areas completely off limits. Stefan Amundsen on Patreon, Patreon writes, Hi Indy, what setting during World War I do you think would be the best or most impressive to bring into the Battlefield 1 game? Been following you before the announcements. Smiley face. We are actually all very excited that we got so many new fans because of the, when the trailer came out and then our trailer review came out. So that's really cool. So I'm glad we got you. Um, let's say, uh, not a setting per se, but I would be excited to hear the sounds of the Great War. You know, um, the, the drumming of old field guns, the, the shrieking of forgotten tank engines, the, the buzzing of the first military aircraft gliding through the skies in pursuit of each other, the cracking of old machine guns, the hissing of shrapnel as it's falling, about to explode through the air. I mean, it's, it's probably kind of morbid curiosity on my part, but it is something, sound, it is something that is totally missing in the history of the Great War, since it was just not possible at the time to record the sounds of the battlefield. Now, okay, not everyone plays video games, and that's fine, but it is a medium that has, like, like movies in a way, the potential to reproduce a world with all of its features that would be otherwise just left to your imagination. And if they do somehow manage to get that game to be even somewhat close to being accurate, like the game for Dunn did before, uh, it would be a win for every history fan. Um, Dan Carlin uh, once said that he would love the idea of flying over one of those ancient battlefields in a balloon just to witness what it was like. Maybe video games are and will be the closest thing we get to fulfill this wishful thinking. If you'd like to see our episode that was just about stormtroops and trench warfare, you can click right here for that. Do not forget to subscribe, and I'll try not to forget the call to action. Uh, see you next time.